Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, for decades, lawyer Roy Cohn persecuted communists, homosexuals, anyone as he saw as an enemy of the hardline right, and of course, became a mentor to one President Donald Trump. Up until, of course, the moment Roy Cohn died of AIDS and Trump shunned him. He's that kind of guy. The documentary Where's My Roy Cohn by Matt Turnauer explores the complex, complicated, and evil history of Cohn in all its raging detail. Let's take a look. Testing one, two, three. Last question today. What makes Roy Cohn tick? Dora Cohn wanted a different son from the son that God gave her. And that imbued him a sense of shame about who he was. His father gave him the language through law and politics to express his shame. Roy Cohn's contempt for people, his contempt for the law, was so evident on his face that you knew you were in the presence of evil. He was like a caged animal. If you opened the door, he would come out and get you. He's this bridge between the legitimate and the illegitimate world. When John Gotti walked into a bowl and shot a guy in the head, Roy managed to get Gotti off. We have Cohn investigating homosexuals very aggressively. But he was the one who threw the group parties. And there were rumors he was picking up male prostitutes. He could pull strings and bring people together. He could pull strings and make people do things. I was in his office when Nancy Reagan called and thanked him for getting her husband elected. Cohn looked at Donald Trump as a protege. Donald had the money, and Roy had the balls and the shrewdness. Attack. Don't settle. Don't apologize. Attack. When you look at Cohn's life, you're shining a light on demagoguery, hypocrisy, and the darkest parts of the American psyche. According to Roy, Roy was responsible for everything important that happened in the United States. Everybody, please welcome Matt Turnauer. Let's hear it. Sir, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I, I could be off base. Uh, I think within your last three documentaries, uh, Studio 54, um, forgive me, I'm going to butcher the title. This is so unfortunate. Scotty's Secret History of Hollywood. Uh, and now, Roy Cohn, there is a through line of, of, of some kind. There is a through line of people who are... Uh, in some ways, living in the cl closet while at the same time living very flamboyantly outside of the closet without being recognized for it in some ways. Does that make sense? Well, I think it's sometimes called the open secret. Thank in you. In terms of uh, gay life where you're in the closet, but in your community, people know. Uh, Roy Cohn's a particular type of person, though. Uh, he was uh, a gay man, a lawyer, uh, became very famous at a young age in politics, uh, not openly gay, but he was a hypocrite because early in his career as a uh, powerful aide to Senator Joseph McCarthy, he persecuted gay men and women in the federal government and ruined their lives. So uh, he actually holds a special place, I think, in Dante's circles of hell uh, <laughs> when you're talking about hypocrisy and, um, and evil, really. I think one thing Roy Cohn knew very well that we see play out right now uh, in, in, in Republican Party politics is that hypocrisy doesn't matter. Power matters, right? Yes, well, the ends justify the means. Yeah. Uh, you, anything you do to win, which is uh, Mitch McConnell's, uh, clearly his playbook. Uh, and McConnell, uh, not to go too deep into contemporary politics, sure. but McConnell uh, is an overt hypocrite. He denies a Supreme Court justice a seat. He makes up some rule about not appointing a Supreme Court justice in the final year of a presidential term. And then he says brazenly that if a seat opens in the final year of uh, a Trump term, he'll appoint someone. This is right out of the Roy Cohn playbook. It's a ruthlessness, a winning at all cost. Winning is everything. And also, uh, politics for the greater good mm -hmm. and for the people, the Constitution, it's we the people, <laughs> you know, uh, is uh, thrown out the window. Everything's for personal gain and, and the accumulation of power. And this was the essence of Roy Cohn. What made you want to make a documentary about Roy Cohn? Well, I was making another documentary in 2016 uh, about Studio 54. Mm -hmm. 
Roy Cohn's a character in that film because he was the lawyer for Studio 54. So I'm sitting in the edit room at the and time. And frequent guest, right? Yes. Part, yeah. Yes. He, a denizen, I believe, <laughs> might be the term. Uh, you know, and he was a decadent uh, man. He was still in the closet, by the way, but Studio 54 was this kind of uh, concentration of all this decadence, and a big part of it was gay life that was out in the open. Cohn was there every night, but he was still not overtly gay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sort of steeping in this archival footage of Cohn, and I'm thinking to myself in 2016, this is a great character. I mean, he's leaping off the screen. He's really uh, so uh, powerful, but dark a presence. Uh, in that year, I thought, of course, Hillary Clinton will win, and there'll be no reason to make a Cohn documentary, because the contemporary hook for Roy Cohn at that time, and still now, is that he was the mentor, really the creator of someone who used to be a failed businessman and kind of character in the New York jokescape, and that's Donald Trump. Well, of course, the Electoral College victory of Trump changed everything, and Cohn goes from being uh, what I would consider to be a bold footnote in American history to being a modern Machiavelli, creating a president from beyond the grave. a modern Machiavelli, right? Yes, and yeah. creates a president from beyond the grave, which is uh, unbelievable, but I think is literally true, because the Trump playbook is the Roy Cohn playbook. So the uh, project took on new life. And What's so interesting about Trump is that so many people have been credited as creating the Trump playbook. Like, I truly believe with you that it is Roy Cohn's playbook and that all of his instincts and all of his behavior are, you know, learned from his time spent under Roy Cohn. But it's been Bannon's playbook. It's been other people's playbook. Do you really see it more as the Cohn playbook than, than anything else? I really do. Cohn predates all these people. Uh, he really, in the post-World War II era, uh, helping to define the McCarthy era, by being Joseph McCarthy's chief aide. And uh, he's there inventing a new kind of demagoguery. And that demagoguery, which is very authoritarian forward, very Machiavellian, where winning is everything, uh, comes down through right-wing politics. And uh, after World War II, politics changed a lot. The right wing reformed itself. The Republican Party becomes the party of the right. And that Roy Cohn playbook informed Richard Nixon, to some extent it informed Ronald Reagan's politics, uh, and then we see it in its greatest manif manifestation today when literally his men mentee, Trump, is president. His protege, if you will, even though he wasn't a lawyer. Or some people say apprentice. <laughs> Why do they say that? I don't get it. Um, what's interesting about that is that Cohn, when we talk about right-wing politics, we often talk about and we talk about corruption, it's behind closed doors, it's like, uh, you know, it's just general political corruption. Certain bills are passed and money goes into certain places, but Cohn was literally affiliated with mobsters. He was siphoning money off of the crime wave in New York City in the 60s and 70s, yet still had incredible allegiances to power, right? Yeah, so I see him occupying a unique place. It's almost a position he created for himself and no one's really filled since, which is he sits on the bridge between the illegitimate world, which is the mob, and the legitimate world, which is politics. He had connections and he had leverage over both of these people. He was a mafia attorney, so literally the dons of the five families of the New York mafia who were at the height of their power when he was at the height of his power are his legal clients. Mm -hmm. And then uh, through his political connections, which were very deep, he was a, also a protege of J. Edgar Hoover, who was FBI director until uh, into the Nixon administration. Uh, he has really a lot of political leverage and a lot of political clout and power brokering and what's called the favor bank is really the way the system worked. And you could say that he was the CEO of the favor bank. And that's where his uh, politics came from. As a lawyer, he used to say, F the judge, uh, or sorry, F the law, right. just tell me who the judge is. Right. That was his method of law, so which is inherently manipulate. corrupt. Right. What's interesting about that is that I feel like there are, in terms of bridges between uh, illegitimate uh, industries, if you will, and, and, and politics, there are people occupying that space all the time. But no one did it as famously and in, as intentionally famously as Roy Cohn did. He didn't shy away from it at all. 
Well, he had, I think, the biggest ambit of all of them. I mean, he just covered so much turf and infiltrated so many worlds. It, you know, the mafia was five families then out of New York. He had contacts with all of them. The political world was still in the clubhouse at the time. You know, good government reforms hadn't really been instituted. Democratic primaries weren't really happening, for instance. It was all backroom stuff. And then you can have a, a malign actor like that really have a lot of concentrated power. A lot of that's been decentralized since then. The mafia has been disempowered. Uh, but he was the, the mayor of this kind of uh, toxic uh, world of politics and corruption. What do you feel like you... Do you in any way find Lo Roy Cohn to be uh, inspirational? No, personally, no. I think Mitch McConnell and Steve Bannon and Roger Stone do. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Roger Stone in the film. Uh, Roger Stone gave me a great interview. I was he always skeptical. does. Well, I was skeptical. I thought he would be kind of prevaricating or equivocating or full of malarkey, as Joe Biden likes to say. Uh, no, actually, he was, I thought, a pretty straight shooter. He knew Roy Cohen very well. He was, he was probably the second most notorious uh, mentee of Roy Cohen after Trump. Uh, and he, I think, admired him uh, in a kind of dirty trickster, di diabolical way. And um, well, what is the thing that he says about him? There was no regrets or remorse at the end at all for anything that he did. He was hard line all the way through to the end. Well, I was asking him about a very specific thing where he, as a young prosecutor, arranged the electrocution of an innocent woman, Ethel Rosenberg, which was dramatized in Kushner's Angels in America. That's yeah. right. And uh, I asked uh, Roger Stone whether Roy Cohn ever felt remorse for that. He's con he condemned an innocent woman to the electric chair when he was 23 years old. Uh, a mother of two, and did he feel remorse? And Stone said what you said. I, I asked him at the end, did he ever feel remorse for that? And he said, if I could have pulled the switch, I would have done it myself. Evil. Yeah, I think, you know, we contemplate now, um, does evil exist? This is a question that we ask ourselves in the context of people like McConnell, frankly, uh, and uh, I'm thinking of uh, gun laws, for instance, and, and other aspects of politics. Uh, President Obama frequently spoke about evil and the existence of evil. I think Cohen is a, a face of evil. Uh, well, just a compassionless heart, right? Like n absolutely no room for love or compassion and mostly just harboring resentments, uh, angers, grievances, and, and, and sort of gamesmanship in terms of how to beat and win against anybody else. And, and that's, the, that's the personal side, okay? <laughs> but the real problem for me is utter selfishness. So everything is for yourself. The, you know, the mafia's nickname for itself is Cosa Nostra, uh, which means our thing in Italian, okay? And that, <laughs> no, well that, Cosa Nostra is our thing, yeah. which says it all. It's for them. The government, the presidency, is not for personal gain or enrichment or gratification. It's for serving the sovereign people of the United States of America. So to have the student of Roy Cohn, who was the ultimate self-interested actor and also mob adjacent and sympathetic, be the president is a, is a very, very serious disaster for this republic. But that said, that sort of rabid individualism that Roy Cohn lived and breathed is an American ideal for many. Yes, but there are lines here, yeah. okay? I think someone like Ayn Rand, for instance, who writes about the individualist, and libertarians, some of them, like Ayn Rand because she, she has that ideal, and r the right wing has taken that up to a certain extent. If you're working within a political context and you're fighting for what you see as individual rights, and they're actually done in a humane context, okay, I can accept that. It's not my personal way of thinking. But if you cross a line, and you are acting on behalf of uh, literally organized crime and stealing for your own personal gain in the way that someone like Vladimir Putin does mm -hmm. uh, as the head of a of, of sovereign state. He's basically a mob boss. Trump seems to admire him. This is Trump this, has always admired mob bosses. It seems so. He, he brags uh, about having hung out with them. Yes. Well, this is a huge problem when you're president. Uh, it's not supposed to work that way here. And uh, this is why I made the movie, because I think the origins of this way of thinking and way of acting 
are uh, really urgent for us to know in what uh, Gore Vidal called the United States of Amnesia. Mm -hmm. We have to wake up and realize where this came from and that Donald Trump is a symptom of it and that we want to eradicate the symptoms going forward. How do you see us eradicating the symptoms? I mean, to me, that seems like a completely a complete radical shift in how we think about ourselves and in this within this country. Well, I mean, this is a country that was capable of electing the first black president who was the opposite of this. So it's it's within our it's within our grasp certainly to do this again. I think that uh the uh, unfortunately, uh, an unintended effect of the Obama presidency was unmasking a really uh, virulent, uh, cancerous uh, network uh, of, or fa a group of factions in this country who are very self interested and uh, poisoned with vile instincts such as racism. And uh, a fair amount of industrialists also doing the unmasking as well. Or using that unmasking as a means to uh, push forward their, their, their goals. This is the network where Roy Cohen thrived. I mean, it was basically uh, corrupt business uh, seducing corrupt constituencies. So these are, you can call them factions, corrupt factions. Right. And when you get enough of them to, to come together, and we see it's about 40% of the vote of the electorate, then you can get a Donald Trump. I don't think we really thought that was possible before this happened, because I think in the wake of the civil rights movement and in uh, the advent of uh, the first black president, uh, we thought that we had moved past that. Uh, clearly, uh, there was a reaction within the body politic that brought us to this moment. Uh, Cohn was, wrote the playbook. He was kind of the cartographer that made the map for Trump. And uh, we need to know how the map was made, which is the point of this movie, to show you that. And with a greater public recognition of that and a greater understanding of how unjust and how really, really damaging this is, I think maybe we can move as a society to uh, correct, course correct, if you will. Do you see, and you may have uh, just answered this, so excuse me for repeating, but uh, do you see, obviously we see Roy Cohn's philosophy permeate throughout Donald Trump himself and maybe members of his administration, members of his party as well. But do you see it also trickling down, not to use a, you know, an 80s economic phrase, trickling down into the body politic even more so? Yeah, I mean, the Tea Party, which predicted Trump in a way, there's a certain kind of selfishness and uh, really cruelty that is endemic in that type of politics. I don't really even understand it, to be honest with you. I think Trump's an extreme manifestation of this. I explain my view of all these self-interested factions yeah. that I think in, in a way are fueled by racism and demagoguery, which we haven't really talked about. Trump, of course, is a demagogue, and Cohn was a, a demagogue whisperer. Joseph McCarthy, his original uh, empty vessel back in the 50s, responsible for the, the witch hunts, Cohen was his Svengali, really. Um, I think that that's one aspect of it, but there is a certain cruelty in that extreme right-wing politics that uh, has created uh, in gridlock and inertia in the Congress, and I think also, by the way, is uh, feeds on itself, because then that creates uh, that kind of legislative inertia, creates a disillusion with the political system, and then that makes people angry, and then that makes people want to just burn down the whole system, and then I think a Trump or a demagogue appeals to that type of voter, so then it becomes a self-perpetuating thing, which I think is part of the explanation for how we got caught in this unexpected uh, quagmire that we're in right now. There's a, a moment uh, of footage uh, from the, I believe it's from the McCarthy uh, hearings where a senator, I'm again butchering this, excuse me, says to McCarthy, and it's a very famous moment, he says, have you no decency, sir? And it was in many ways the thing that kind of rocked McCarthy. I mean, he was sort of on the outs at that point anyway, he was going too far, but that moment on television really shocked the nation and it really put forward a kind of integrity or an idea as to how we can be better people. Do you ever, I mean, I was nostalgic seeing that because I think at the moment we see representatives and senators trying to get those moments on a daily basis. And because we are 
uh, inundated with the, with moments like that, we never actually know when something is as significant as a moment like that was. Well, I think this has to do with the media landscape. It's very fractured. So uh, at the time, you're referring to Joseph Welch, who was the uh, counsel for the Army, actually, in the Army McCarthy hearings. And this is when, to summarize very briefly, McCarthy and Cohn are accusing the Army of being infiltrated by communists. And it was all a personal thing for Cohn because he wanted his male love interest to be promoted from private to general. He had been drafted. Uh, and he, was tr he called the Secretary of the Army Cohen, who was just counsel to a Senate committee, and said, this guy, G. David Shine, who was kind of his boy toy, this is in the 1950s, by the way, unbelievably, when all this is happening, uh, he calls the Secretary of the Army and says, Roy Cohn here, uh, Shine's not a private, he's getting a promotion to general, and I want him to be posted at the Waldorf Astoria in the penthouse. <laughs> this was actually not made up, this is what he said, and the Secretary of the Army said no. Uh, and then he said, I'm going to wreck the Army, and that's what the Army McCarthy hearings really were about, uh, and McCarthy went along with it, which shows you what a, a doof he was, and they tried to destroy the army, and the army pushed back, and then Joseph Welch said... Why do you think McCarthy went along with it? I mean, I think he was, a, I think he was not the sharpest tool in the drawer, and I think that Cohen had mesmerized him. He was very bright. No one, no one ever said he was anything other than brilliant, and McCarthy was kind of had no compass, he just wanted attention and notoriety. Do you think Cohn like walked up to McCarthy and was like, "Hey, you know there are communists in the army now?" And he's like, "What? Do yes. a, let's do a thing." That, about it's it. about as simple as that, quite <laughs> frankly. And also, gay people. He was uh, ironically because he's gay, but not not overtly. Uh, he convinces McCarthy that there's a gay cabal as well, and then they go after gay people in the government and destroy their lives. Hmm. This is where Cohen, yeah. the essence of Cohen, which is another sort of Trumpy thing that we see, which is, I'll accuse you of what I'm guilty of and see how you respond to that, and I'll confuse everyone, and then we'll just have a fight, and then everyone will forget what the whole subject was about, and then it'll be tomorrow, and I'll talk about buying Greenland. Or I'll just uh, accuse you of something that I made up because I want to do this exact same thing that you just said, right? Yeah, so this is the, the playbook of Roy Cohn. And it's become the playbook of not just the president or one person. What's interesting is that it is the playbook of the entire right wing in a lot of ways. Trump said the other day, the DOJ should look into Obama's Netflix deal at eight o'clock at that at eight o'clock that night. It was leading Tucker Carlson's show. Yes. Well, I mean this is back to your question, why does Joseph Welch saying on national television at long last or have you no sense of decency and it catches the conscience of an entire nation. McCarthy was censured and dead within a few years after that. Cohn, of course, as the vampire of vampires, like removes the wooden stake from his heart and reinvents himself as a mob lawyer and power broker in New York and lives seemingly happily ever after until the 80s when um, he's disbarred and dies from HIV AIDS. Um, so, I mean, it's just that the media at that time was just so concentrated that you could have a moment like that. Now, um, Trump, you know, can change the subject and Tucker Carlson will pick it up and people who watch Fox watch Fox and people who watch MSNBC watch MSNBC and never the twain shall meet. Uh, however, I do see some insidious creep in this uh, kind of media demagoguery because someone I admire, Chris Hayes, for instance, he has a great, he's so smart, he has a great show on MSNBC, but they have an hour to fill every night. And by segment three, they're talking about Greenland and Trump. Yep. I love and, Chris Hayes. I feel the exact same way right. where you can't, it's, you turn it in and you're like, he's too smart to be talking about this part of this thing that happened today. But you see, that's the, the media beast. And this is what Cohen understood is that the media needs copy. That's how it works. And journalists, I'm a journalist as well as a filmmaker, we are trained to report accurately the story. And if the story that day, because the president, when he wants to be the story, is always the story, is buying Greenland, then on the news, you're going to get something about buying Greenland. How you frame it, and Hayes and all the MSNBC people, who I think are bright and well-intentioned, uh, try to frame it in an intelligent and useful way. But they're still talking about Greenland, and they're still talking about Donald Trump. 
and this is the victory of Trump, which is the victory posthumously of Cohen, because Cohen taught that to Trump. And uh, that's is the point back to the movie. This is why we made it, because you want to know where this comes from, because Trump is really a symptom of a, of a larger problem. And uh, we'll, we'll always have demagogues. This country's always had demagogues. It's had Father Coughlin, who was a right-wing priest, Huey Long, who was the senator and governor of Louisiana, a very uh, dangerous man who was a demagogue. They never came near the White House. Uh, George Wallace. Yeah never came near the White House. Many said laid the groundwork for Trump as well in terms of campaigning and the silent majority. Yes, yeah, so well he's part of a racial, uh, racial minor a, a minority of racist politicians in this country who had to, were expressing themselves in, during and after the civil rights movement. And Trump is certainly a part of that cohort. Uh, but none of these people got near the White House. This is unthinkable, I think, Many of us wake up every morning and kind of have to shake ourselves and say, is this really happening? I mean, it seems like a fever dream. And that's very, um, I think, uh, similar to the Roy Cohn ethos as well. It's just like flood the zone. Yeah. The more information, the better. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Uh, as long as you're the story, keep the narrative going. People will f change the story the next day. Greenland is followed by Sharpie Gate. That we're even calling it Sharpie Gate is upsetting. Which he intentionally kept going for like two weeks. Right, because it's all about it's all about Donald. Yeah. And um, if he were working within the the realm of normal politics and were a normal politician who was not a dangerous demagogue, then his media his communication strategy would be what it is. But it's toward another end. And he knows that. He's creating an open-ended spy drama. He's somehow managed to become the maestro of this like, global psychodrama with him at the center of it. And it's on because he's the president of the United States and has the nuclear arsenal at his disposal. Like, the stakes couldn't be higher. This is the stuff of reality television, Gotterdammerung, up to the 10,000th power. Uh, so here, the student has outstripped the master. Because Cohen was playing, he was never any sort of official elected person. He, he worked on a kind of below ground, uh, very extensive secret power grid that he operated. But this is another thing altogether. Right. Um, let's talk about the end of Roy Cohn's life, where uh, he's diagnosed with HIV AIDS. He hides it, uh, but he's in inter interviews and he's sick. He's clearly sick, and he's people know that he's sick. He's telling people that he has um, liver disease or liver cancer, right? And uh, it's fascinating because the '80s and the AIDS epidemic is one of the most tragic periods in American history. And any time I've seen a story, read a story, documentary, fiction, if you're telling that story, it is heartbreaking no matter who you're talking about because um, it, was, it was in some ways avoidable at times, right? I mean, there was research that could have been done earlier that wasn't done due to homophobia, and so communities were just wiped out. And people were just dealing with death on a day-to-day -day basis. But when it's Roy Cohn, there is this little bit in you that's like, oh, why, you have somehow removed <laughs> my ability to feel empathy for you in this because he did, he was almost one of the people making others unable to get the drugs. I don't think he was actually, but he would have done that if he could have. Well, the Reagans, so the AIDS epidemic starts in the early 80s, the Reagans are in power. Uh, and the Reagan administration was uh, absolutely uh, culpable for yeah not uh, backing the research and creating uh, public awareness about the HIV AIDS crisis. Uh, it's a black mark on the record of that administration. Cohn was very in with the Reagans, very close to them. He already was a world-class hypocrite as a gay man who persecuted and destroyed the lives of other gay people in the government when he was persecuting people in what was called the Lavender Scare, where they were rooting out so-called sex perverts, that would be gay people, in, in the parlance of the 50s Senate Investigation Committee, uh, from the government. He's behind it. So what do you do with that? I mean, this is, this is hypocrisy of a, of a magnitude that we rarely see. Then decades later, he contracts HIV AIDS, still is not out. Um, and I think because he's a, 
a public figure who thrusts himself into the media spotlight, a hypocrite about his sexuality, a malignant actor, we have to assail him for that. And then when he gets the worst disease possible at that moment, uh, it's hard to feel empathy for someone with that record, but then it gets worse. He actually, through the Reagans, sought and received special treatment that no one else could get virtually at the National Institutes of Health. He was in an experimental treatment program that the Reagans got him into and monitored his, his health. There are documents, or correspondence between them with Reagan, who's ignoring HIV AIDS, sending him missives, saying, I hope you're doing well, we're, you know, we're paying attention, we hear you're doing better, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do with that t type of hypocrisy? And that really, um, I think, uh, negates any empathy or sympathy you can feel for a character like that. You never want to say that's karma, especially in regards to a disease, like any disease, but a disease like that in that period of time. But the Cone story feels almost like the definition of karma when you come to its end. You, you can look at it that way, uh, of course. But I think, you know... Sex is politics in a lot of ways, but when the HIV AIDS crisis happened, it elevated it to a dimension that we really didn't have to contemplate in, in modern society up until that time in, in that big a way. And because it was about same sexuality in large part, at least in, in this country and many others, uh, it had a special, uh, if you want to say, motif to it that just made people nervous, freaked people out. There was a, a kind of like ner collective nervous breakdown going on. But politics could have actually helped this crisis. And instead, Cohen's on the side of politics that is not helping, and in fact, actively killing people. So there's a sort of just recklessness, hypocrisy, and bloody legacy to the actions of this one man that I think, again, uh, the world needs to know about because he's kind of a forgotten figure. I don't think I would have made this movie uh, or been uh, able to make it so easily uh, if Trump had lost because the Cohen connection to Trump is the why now of this film. Uh, and I think it's a very powerful one. Uh, but all of these things, all of this callousness and selfishness and really evil doing, I think, we need to understand, and we need to understand the motivation of it, and we need to understand how it propelled a certain political movement that led to a Trump. Absolutely. Uh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's the question? Right here. Hey. Hi. Hi, Matt. Um, I saw the film at Sundance. We had a brief talk at that time. Um, looking, based on the research that you did, say we see McCarthy, um, in Citizen Jane, Robert Moses, and then Cohen, they all have their downfall. They all have their rise and fall. So my question for you would be this. Um, do you see the current Cohen clone demise to be in the near future? Uh, my crystal ball is a little uh, tarnished today. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've been rooting for impeachment it seems to be the logical thing. Uh, Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler, I think, are doing their level best. And I think it should go forward. Uh, so I can't really say. I think there has to be a political process because uh, just the way the, uh, the government works, quite frankly. Um, I take some solace in a, something that Franklin Roosevelt said, which is, I'll have to paraphrase it, but it was the bright line of history trends ever upward. And he said that in the context of the Great Depression and a looming fascist takeover of Europe where things seemed very dark indeed. We might seem to be in a dark age or have a dark age looming, but uh, if you do look at the trend line, it tends to go over upward. And there are a lot of things that point to a uh, correction from this dark moment. So that's the best I can say. Uh, one more. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering how long you've been interested in making a film about the subject of Roy Cohn, and also how much the political landscape of the past few years either reinvigorated that or added a new context to it. I had never thought of a film on Cone uh, until 
2016, and I was seeing him in all this footage that I was kind of putting together for this other Studio 54 movie. I knew about him. I'd seen Angels in America. I'd read Citizen Cone, which is the great biography of him by the late Nicholas von Hoffman. And I was a journalist in New York for Vanity Fair, which covers that world, really. So I, I was familiar. Uh, but really, it was the context of Trump and this particular relationship that I thought, and this movie was started, by the way, in 2016, late 2016, so I've been working on it for a while, and it's just coming out now, it's the way movies go. And it, by the way, it opens this Friday, the 20th, in movie theaters. Um, <laughs> but uh, making those connections, uh, connecting the dots between Cohn, who we think of as a, a historical figure from the relatively distant past, to the now was the motivation for this. And I, I think it's an urgent thing that we in the United States of amnesia need to know about. And uh, that was my motivation for making the film. There's a moment uh, in the film where Cohn is uh, going on trial and is going to be disbarred and character witnesses come out to sort of testify on his behalf. And people like Donald Trump and a, and a host of others. And they essentially all lie under oath. And one of your... Uh, one of your subjects that you're interviewing says that they lie, knowingly lie, and says that's power. And I thought that was such a uh, smart thing to say and is also very illustrative of where we are right now as people in the administration, people who've worked for Trump, Trump himself, go ahead and lie repeatedly under oath and not under oath. Yes, I think that resonates now. It's astonishing to me that it's somehow now optional to respond to a congression, congressional subpoena and that elected officials can blatantly lie uh, from the president on down, and I'm referring to the Republicans, not the Democrats, uh, because it's definitely one-sided and get away with it. This is related to a propaganda technique. Again, Cohen and McCarthy uh, subscribe to it. It's called the big lie. It came from Nazi Germany, actually. Uh, it's been studied extensively. And basically, it's just keep lying. And the bigger the lie, the more people believe it, because it's almost unbelievable to think that such a big lie could actually be untrue. And it's a, it's a very effective propaganda technique that I think, uh, to name a name, uh, Mitch McConnell certainly practices, and uh, uh, Donald Trump is making a presidency out of. Uh, Matt, I love the film. Incredible work again by you. You're one of our great documentary filmmakers right now. Uh, it's called Where's My Roy Cohn? It opens this Friday, right? People can see it? This Friday in New York and L.A., and then it goes nationwide in movie theaters. Fantastic. Everybody give Matt a huge round of applause. Let's Thank hear you. it.